Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton, and this week I am joined by DJ McGuire. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to the voters of Argentina who are dollarizing their economy, driving up dollar demand, and bringing down American inflation next year, just in time for the president's re-election. I like that. And also here is Rebecca chodoff Kushmeider. Did, did I pronounce that middle name correctly, Chodov? Yep, it's Chodov. It's Russian. Not not the bad kind of Russian, the, the kind that, you know, fled pogroms. So this is a time. This is a place. You want to run your mouth? We can be two consenting adults. We can finish it here. You want to do it now? Well, stand your butt up. <laughs> Which senator said that this week? Uh, that would be Mark Wayne Mullen, <laughs> senator from Oklahoma, to which Bernie Sanders said, you are a United States senator. He had to chastise it. <laughs> That's the best part is Bernie Sanders saying, this is a United States senator. This is a hearing. God knows the American people have enough contempt for Congress. Let's not make it worse. <laughs> Turning Bernie Sanders into the equivalent of a hockey referee. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, that was just one of the best things I've ever seen on television. So we're going to talk once again tonight about politics, a lot of foreign affairs in the, in the news. But we wanted to, on the domestic front, acknowledge the passing of Rosalind Carter, a first lady, obviously the wife of Jimmy Carter. And uh, I was a big fan. I would imagine uh, you guys have something uh, nice to think about uh, in her memory as well. Yeah, she was a, a person who really, you know, put her life philosophy into practice, did a lot of good works alongside her husband. And my thoughts go out to, to their family in this in this sad time. Yes. Condolences, of course, with the recognition that she lived to be 96. She had a very long and a very full life and good for her. And good yes. for her. There you go. May we all be so lucky. So foreign policy experience matters. And we're learning that this week as the Biden administration is close. We, we don't want to jinx it by mentioning it on this podcast, but they seem close to brokering a deal with Qatar and with the Israelis and Hamas. And I'm not sure who else might be involved to get some hostages released and maybe have some kind of a pause in the fighting there. Is this a significant achievement or is this just a lot of posturing uh, that doesn't mean a lot? I think there's less to this than meets the eye. I think Hamas now understands that the hostages are not going to be a deterrent to Israeli military action. So now they are just a public relations nightmare for them. And I think as far as Hamas is concerned, the sooner that they can get them out, uh, the better. Uh, if it comes with a pause, then Hamas can use their disinformation allies and their misinformation allies to try to push for the pause to to be longer or to condemn the Israelis when they stop the pause after five days. I do give the administration credit for keeping the lines of communication open so that everyone can know that they are on the same page here. That's always difficult to do in a war, particularly a war like this. Uh, and that's good for the hostages. And yes, that is good for the administration. But it can't distract from the end game and the end game is a gaza with hamas still in charge is bad for israel it's bad for palestine and it's bad for everyone else i have to agree on on that final point there dj and i i was listening to an interview with benjamin netanyahu this week he spoke to um NPR, and he has acknowledged that he intends to be an occupying force in gaza but is not making any clear points about what kind of governance he wants to put in place. And the international community has also remained decidedly silent on that. And obviously, it's premature to to try and say what should happen. But the fact that nobody's saying anything at all is troubling to me. Well, let, let's, let's talk about that. Because I think you hit on something there. It, it might be premature. And I know everyone wants to see, as DJ calls it, as the world calls it, the end game. I do as well. We all want this to be resolved peacefully and effectively. 
and hopefully not have this this conflict go on for another 50 years. But isn't it too soon to be trying to determine the future of Gaza when the goal of the Israelis, whether people agree with it or not, it is their goal, is to wipe out the organization that governs Gaza. And if they can achieve that, something has to fill the void. And what I think Netanyahu is doing is filling a void so the world isn't going, well, what's going to happen in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days when many of these Hamas fighters have been killed and the rest who are in high-level positions have fleed the country? So is it really a land grab or is it more filling a political void that needs to be filled? Because the reality is someone's going to have to govern that area when Hamas is no longer an organization that can do it. And until we can figure out who and what that looks like, the Israelis are the only players on the field. Am I wrong? Not necessarily. And I didn't read as much into what Bibi was saying as as you did, Kevin. I don't think Bibi trusts anyone in Gaza to actually run Gaza. I think in his perfect scenario, Israel does occupy Gaza ad infinitum. But he can't say that because he knows that's unpopular in the rest of the world, and it's also unpopular in Israel. Gaza occupation has never been popular in Israel. What we cannot do under any circumstances is give Bibi a free hand in Gaza. We can't say, okay, it's all yours. We will we will trust you to rebuild Gaza in the, the way it should be. Two-thirds of Israelis don't trust Benjamin Netanyahu to run their country anymore, <laughs> Yes, let yes, alone Gaza. Right. His, his numbers are so, terrible. They're worse than Biden's. <laughs> well, he's out. I mean, I, I got to say this. And of course, predictions are predictions. It's all speculation. But His future as the leader of Israel is not long-term. He is not going to survive the next election whenever that is. I think he's trying to solidify his political position now in the hopes that he can hang on for another six months or a year. But there is going to be a post-Netanyahu Israel sooner rather than later. I agree. And that, I mean, the the fact of Benjamin Netanyahu's tenuous position is, it makes this more complicated because he is tap dancing as fast as he can to try and salvage a political future and a future outside of prison for himself. Yes. Which is in conflict with what we would ideally see for Gaza, which is, you know, the, the on-ramp to a two-state situation. But I think that the fact that Netanyahu specifically and other interested parties more generally, the fact that we're not saying we want to eliminate Hamas and then create a democratic process or a self-governance process for Gaza is a mistake because I think that if we want to be viewed as liberators, to to quote the Bush administration, we should be acting like liberators and talking like liberators. It's not just that we're in here to annihilate this set of bad actors. We are in here to annihilate them and then help you get back on your feet. Unfortunately, there are far too many people in in the hall in the corridors of power in Washington and in European capitals and even a number of of Arabian capitals who think that the Palestinian Authority has to retake control of Gaza. I, I happen to be one of them, but I, but I'm I'm really interested to hear what you say. Yeah, for one, the Palestinian Authority's numbers may be worse than, than BB's or Biden's yes. at this point. I was going to say, the Palestinian um, they, Authority is, they're no friend to democracy either. They are not somebody, they're not a group that's trusted in Gaza. They have had no real presence in Gaza in 17 years. And their presence in the West Bank, such as it is, is corrupt and ineffectual. I think what we really need is a three state solution Israel, Gaza, and then Eastern Palestine. Let me ask you this, DJ, because I really, you know, respect your knowledge of history far, far beyond mine. Is it possible to take a small area like Gaza that is overcrowded, 50% of their residents are under or 18 or under, and it's impoverished? Can you just turn that type of of an environment over to the people and say, here you go, you're now a country, run yourselves. I mean, it's one thing to hand power 
to a country that has some type of an economy that has an infrastructure, which, by the way, whatever infrastructure they had, unfortunately, is being blown to bits now, and that's a whole other conversation to have. But can we simply expect these people, not that I'm putting them down, but given the situation there, is it realistic to just say you're a country now? It's, I mean, they're obviously going to need something similar to to a Marshall Plan to Mm -hmm. help rebuild, to help rebuild there. But I do not think it is all that unusual to have even a small urbanized area like Gaza be given self-determination. The island of Singapore was a basket case in 1965 when Malaysia just said, we're out, you handle this crap on your own. And Singapore is now one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So I do think it is possible. There had been, prior to Hamas taking things over, there had been a lot of talk about Gaza as a tourist destination. It is on the Mediterranean, after all. Uh, there are there are always opportunities for uh, for high, for the highly educated to develop to to build skills based economies. So I do think there are there is tremendous potential for an independent self determining Gaza to be a very prosperous part of the Mediterranean community. They are going to need some help. Absolutely. But I don't think it is impossible, no. Okay. I, it, this just came to me. I swear to you, it just came to me as you were speaking, DJ. I have solved this problem. Oh, I can't wait. It's it's so simple. It's right in front of our noses. Give Gaza to the Trump organization. Oh, brilliant, Kevin. <laughs> They're great at building things, right? Eric is a builder. <laughs> They're very good. Yeah, Eric with, is a builder with, with Legos. Right. They're very good with beachfront property. My God, what they could do in Gaza in a matter of months. It's it it's I'm very excited, frankly. And you know what? It, they could build a casino. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lara Trump could be the headlining performer. You know, she's just dropped a new single, an acoustic version of a Tom Petty song. Yep. I think this is a real winner. And instead of Trump, I got it. Instead of Trump Plaza, it's Trump Gaza. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, 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 it writes itself. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, if you were wondering how we got the title for this episode, there it is. <laughs> So uh, what I've noticed over the last few days, you know, I was kind of impressed with how Biden seems to have handled and come out of the meeting with with Chi. And yet every day I see a new set of headlines and, and new hair on fire talking heads on cable news telling us how his poll numbers are worse than they were 12 hours ago. They're the worst in history. They're the worst of any modern president, blah, blah, blah. They're better than Trump's ever were. Actually, I don't think that's oh, really? true. But mm. but I might be wrong. I know that they're they're better than George Bush's at the end of his second term, but that's not saying much. No, it's not. Uh, I'm not sure that he would have been reelected. So I want to read something that a friend of mine posted on Facebook this week. His name is Jeffrey Sherman. He's a he's a talented writer and musician and musical songwriter in his own right. But he wrote something about Biden that I think is worth sharing with our listeners. And this is what Jeffrey wrote. I just heard someone again on one of the two networks I watch snidely describe President Biden's age as showing in his speech. And he put age in quotes. I need to get something off my chest. To me, our president seems incredibly strong, wise, and experienced, particularly for a man who works seven days a week has high-level meetings all day long with top leaders, has daily briefings, actually reads the reports given to him, and how much more we don't know or see. I think he's a superman. Jeff goes on to write, All those immense pressures and demands, and after all he's been doing to rebalance the world, after the last disaster and pandemic and two major wars, spending all day with the leader of China, At the end of his long day, you think he may look a little tired? I'm exhausted just writing that. 
I'm so done with people jumping on this truly great president for his age. This man is kind and wise and experienced and fair and a healer. And he is surrounded by the best, most brilliant people, not his cronies and relatives. And they all are humble, intelligent, expertly navigate all the world's craziness in a very turbulent time. And Jeff, I know that I didn't get all of the punctuation right of that. He goes on to write, Joe Biden is a genuine family man, a world-respected statesman and a gentleman. We are blessed he is at the helm, especially now. We are blessed that he is willing to serve our country at such a critical time. And Jeff writes, I respect older people. They have done and experienced everything you and I have and so much more. If you don't believe me, ask your parents and grandparents. Thank you, Joe Biden, and all your equally superhero team that work long hours late into the night so I can sleep at night. Go, Joe. And he had several exclamation points. I thought that that was quite eloquent, and it it really is something that I think and sometimes express not as eloquently or in as much detail as, as Jeff did. I just do not understand why Democrats, forget Republicans, they're in a different metaverse. But I do not understand why Democrats do not appreciate everything this man has done and his efforts to try to save the world. I can. I think I can address that. Please. T- Tip O'Neill once said of, of, of Ronald Reagan, he would have been a terrible prime minister, but a great king. I think Joe Biden is actually the reverse of that. He's problematic as a king, but as a prime minister, he's fantastic. As the head of the of the American government, he has major accomplishments under his belt, but they haven't really paid as much attention to the optics as most quote unquote modern or younger politicians would today. We have to remember Joe Biden came into the Senate in nineteen seventy two He was there eight years when Ronald Reagan first came into office and first sort of began the the sort of shift towards optics that we've been seeing ever since. And Biden at the time, probably instinctively and personally, just kind of was repulsed by that. This is a guy who is very earnest about his job, who is determined to do his job, and who thinks doing his job and doing it well is its best advertisement for doing it again. That is not the case in 2023, and he has campaign people who will fix that for 2024, so there's not something that I'm particularly worried about. But it's just, it is not Joe Biden's nature to brag about the things that he is doing and to boast about the things that he's doing and say, look at me, I'm number one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another question about domestic politics. Uh, I've missed discussing this with you. We were the last several weeks. We've been talking so much about it, Israel, and and for good reason. But did anybody see Joe Manchin on Meet the Press this morning, or any of his other weekend interviews, where uh, he's now flirting with the idea of running for president? I don't really spend a lot of time watching Joe Manchin. Joe, what? Yeah. So, so let me fill you in. And of course, I'm, I'm going to only be able to paraphrase what he said, but I'm going to come as close as possible. So he's being interviewed today by uh, Kristen Welker on uh, Meet the Press. And she asked him directly, if you did run, wouldn't you be a spoiler? And he went through a lot of, you know, uh, boilerplate stuff. I've never been a spoiler in my whole life, whatever that means. And then he said, I mean, look back at Ross Perot. Who would have thought that he would help elect President Clinton? And as I know you're thinking right now, DJ, because it was my first thought, that's exactly what everybody was thinking back then. That's all they were thinking about. The Bush administration was scared to death, and rightly so, of Ross Perot, when Perot had at one point announced he was dropping out of the presidential contest right after the Democratic convention. The polls got a little even again, and there's a there's a better than even chance that had Ross Perot not siphoned off 19% of the electorate, George Bush might have been very competitive and even won that election. The idea that Ross Perot was a spoiler for George H.W. Bush and not for Bill Clinton is insane, but that's what he was selling today on the talk shows. 
Well, it's, it's like saying Nader didn't have an an effect on Al Gore's And there presidency. were people it's that like make that Jill argument. It's like then Jill Stein siphoned off the margin of, of uh, error in like Wisconsin in 2016. The extra candidates changed the dynamics of races. You can't deny that. It's mathematics. I'm going to actually... I'm actually looking at this a little differently. For one... If you look at the di- if you look at the difference in the Green Party vote between 2012 and 2016, it was not enough to actually flip the election. No, it was ge- it was so ge- you can't it was a say- geographic flip. It wasn't overall. It gave the- Even if you look in those states, I mean, it's it's not as if the Green Party got zero support in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin in 2012. And I am going to find it very hard to believe that someone who voted for the Green Party against Barack Obama in 2012 was a natural Hillary Clinton voter in 2016. That has that just has me. I'm not sure I'm buying that. The thing about Joe Manchin, I think, in terms of him not being a spoiler, he is right, but not for the reasons he thinks and not for the reasons he wants. Joe Manchin would like us to believe that he can cobble together all of the middle vote and somehow be competitive and somehow be in a position where he could either where he could knock one of the knock either Trump or Biden into third place, which Ross Perot almost did to Bill Clinton in early 1992. But that's a different discussion for another podcast. I think Joe Manchin can't be a spoiler because Joe Manchin is as clear as mud when it comes to his issue set. This is a man who has been all over the place on all sorts of issues, a man that it was nearly impossible to negotiate with because he kept changing his position all throughout 2021 and 2022. This is not someone who can consistently build a base of anyone at all. He has basically been tap dancing his way to elections as governor of West Virginia and then as United States senator from West Virginia in ways that would make him completely anathema to nearly every other high information swing voter that he thinks he can sweep in to this coalition of his that really doesn't exist. If no labels actually ran Larry Hogan, and I know, Rebecca, you can't stand him, but in the rest of the country, Larry Hogan has a pretty decent reputation as a man of principle who has an issue set that we all know and who could, in fact, win over a number of like-minded people to his side. Joe Manchin doesn't have any like-minded people because Joe Manchin isn't the same Joe Manchin from week to week or from day to day. Well, let's let's also do some polling to see. I mean, let's do polling on Larry Hogan's name recognition and then let's do polling on Joe Manchin's name recognition. And let me tell you, he, neither of them have the saturation of a Joe Biden or a Donald Trump. That is also you know, true. So the few people who know as much about Joe Manchin as you do include you, Joe Manchin, his chief of staff. Yeah, that's it. So you know who definitely is a spoiler? Elon Musk. But he's spoiling his own companies. Oh, my God. Yeah. So let's talk for a moment about uh, Mr. Musk. I don't think he gets called that too often, but that's a good name for him, Mr. Musk. Um, what it sounds is it like a he- really, really terrible cologne. It sure does. <laughs> yep. Uh, Twitter's ad revenues are in the tank. Uh, major advertisers are now pulling out or threatening to pull out after he openly supported anti-Semitism. I didn't quite understand, and I did the research and read the comment that he either liked or retweeted. I didn't quite understand what the point of it was. Uh, would somebody please educate me as to what this this man put his, his imprinter on this week? Sure. Basically, what random dude whose handle I don't remember said was, in effect— that American Jews have been all in on the Great Replacement. They've been all in on building up racial minorities in America. And now all those other racial minorities supposedly hate Jews because they think Jews are white too. And ha ha, look look at how the Jews ironically stumbled onto themselves. It's really horribly tragic, but 
they did it to themselves. The, the, the standard thing anti-Semites always say about Jews, they did it to themselves. And Elon Musk said, you speak the actual truth. Narrator voice, it was not the actual truth. <laughs> and that's why everybody is running away from Elon Musk. Because Elon Musk did what all anti-Semites do, is that whenever they have the opportunity to come out from hiding under the anti-Zionist blanket, they will do it because they are that dumb. And so this is what's happening to him. And he did it to himself. Yeah, no, he he was he he supported anti-Semitism with his own words. He didn't even just hit like. He uh he amplified it. And now companies like IBM, Apple, uh Disney, Comcast, uh NBC Universal do not want to have ads on his social media platform. And he's mad. He's, I think, threatening to sue them for not advertising. So he blew up a rocket on the taxpayer's time. <laughs> and we, we, we have to remember what Elon Musk is, is an actual product of. Nepotism and the apartheid state? <laughs> There's that. <laughs> but in terms, of, in terms of his success in the United States. Stealing other people's ideas and monetizing them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and monetizing them through government industrial policy. We don't have a counterfactual anywhere, but I am now going to stick my neck out and say that the electric car market probably would have been bigger but for Elon Musk. Probably might have been more saturated into the American car market but for Elon Musk. Industrial policy is about government picking winners and losers and usually... Government picks the wrong one. And Elon Musk is a spectacular example of this. The entire IT industry is now looking at Tesla and saying, did he F up that, co that company too? Yeah, he probably did. Can we, can, can we just take a step back and wonder what would have happened in the electric car market if the government hadn't picked an apartheid baby who doesn't actually know a damn thing about anything and thrown him the billions of dollars to develop an electric well, car. Well, and, and his, I mean, his, the early model of Tesla's was to create, you know, this artificial scarcity. He certainly could have manufactured more of them, but like to build this waiting list and these high prices, you know, the, the idea of exclusivity, he was trying to create the Birkin bag of electric cars. And I remember a friend of mine, her, um, her father was on the wait list for a Tesla, and he's like, only six more months, and, and then I'll get an email. Not a car, but an email about getting a car. And she, meanwhile, had walked onto a lot and bought a Nissan Leaf that day. So, you know, it was, it, it was this, he created this ridiculous model, and the idea of a Tesla certainly did drive people to be like, oh, well, electric cars are pretty cool, and I can go buy a Nissan Leaf tomorrow. But... Um, yeah, he uh, he he was trying to use scarcity to boost demand and and Birkin bag it, and it it just it all ended up just being dumb. And now the cars explode, and they're right. they're they're uh, vulnerable like to hackers, rockets. like his rockets and like <laughs> Twitter. And Basically, like, Twitter. like Elon Musk is really really good at losing money. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And a lot of it is ours. Or was. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't pay eight dollars a month to Twitter for a blue check. Right. <laughs> so moving on to other topics that Kevin doesn't understand this week, because frankly, it's easier for me to ask you guys than to do the hard <laughs> research. <laughs> All of my DMs to DJ are like, hey, I don't know what this means. And I could I could look this up, but you already did. So That's what we do all day long all week long between shows is we're PMing each other saying, DJ, what does this mean? <laughs> and for if 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 we're going to the bullet, I think we're going to. I don't know either. <laughs> 
<laughs> so let's go there. It's uh, the Colorado judge who had a chance to rule on whether Donald Trump should be allowed to run on the Colorado presidential ticket or whether he should be excluded from it. And I did not understand this this ruling. The judge apparently found or believes that Trump did in some form or fashion commit sedition, but that the 14th Amendment does not apply to the office of president of the United States. Could somebody please enlighten me on what the logic is there? No, because the, the logic is, is missing. I, I want to just step in for a second and just clarify. I'm one of the people who thinks as much as I hate Donald Trump, and I, I shouldn't use the word hate, but I do despise this man and I despise him as a politician. I'm one of the people who thinks that he that the 14th Amendment doesn't apply unless he's been convicted of sedition. Now, that's me. That's my opinion. So I'm one of the people who thinks that he should be allowed to run, but I still don't understand this, this ruling. And that's the same thing I feel that, you know, and it's why the shaman guy can run. He wasn't convicted of sedition. He was convicted of trespassing or something. And you can run if you have been convicted of trespassing in the past. Trump has not been convicted so far of anything except fraud in the state of New York. And that is, that's not covered under the the 14th Amendment. So if the judge had said, absent a conviction, we cannot withhold ballot access, that's a valid legal argument in my mind, because it is saying that you can't just take, you can't deny people the privilege of running for office without do cause. On an inference that people think he might have been guilty of it. There's got to be some, right. some hard legal determination. And yeah. it's similar to like what Jamie Raskin and Katie Porter said about why they did not vote to expel George Santos. There's a lot of talk, but he has not been convicted. He has not, or at the time, had not been the, the subject of an ethics investigation in the House that said this guy is, you know, couldn't spell ethics with uh, two hands and a letter board. So that argument I would completely buy. But this argument of whether or not the president counts as an officer under the 14th Amendment, that's like the judge was trying to somehow cop out of this decision and may have made it worse. There is no utter logic behind this. There are other parts of the Constitution, such as, say, Article 2, which refers to the presidency as an office. (laughs) So if the presidency is an office, then the president would therefore be an officer. I think this is a situation where the judge tried to split the baby and tried to say, yes, the judge wanted to say that, yes, he engaged in acts of insurrection without actually having to go through removing him from the ballot in Colorado. And right. Right. The prop the but the problem with that is the original example of the 14th Amendment coming into force which was in reaction to the Civil War that didn't come from that didn't come from mil- from military convictions or anything. That came from it it came from being part of the Confederacy. That's it. That's that's it. It's over. So the idea that Donald that the that the oath Donald Trump took on January 2017 did not bind him for removal and refusal to serve in to serve in any future office based on what happened in 2021 that's just that is mind-boggling to me the constitution makes clear that the only entity that can remove that disability is congress and it has to do it by a two-thirds vote and Congress has never had that kind of vote on Donald Trump. So I'm not really sure. I mean, I get there was precedent, there was a precedent, and that was the concern. But the reality is judges in Alabama or Tennessee or Florida would have ruled the other way, would have given something like what Rebecca's explanation, or just would have said January 6th wasn't an insurrection because those judges are so whacked Or they might say that a primary is not an election. It's a nominating contest governed by rules of the party, not the 14th Amendment. Or or that. And it would have gone to the the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would have basically said, 
would have found some way to say, no, this is something for the American people, and they would have punted, like the Supreme Court has always done. You know. I'm like, no, the Supreme Court would have crowned him king, but that's, sorry. <laughs> We've pretty much gone through our topics. Before I wrap up, is there anything that you guys want to talk about this week that wasn't on the docket, anything on your mind that you didn't get out? Uh, yes, we have gone through another week with no new funding for Ukraine. That bothers me. It still does. And it will bother me if it happens again next week. Um, I'm bothered by the fact that when confronted with the fact that Kevin McCarthy elbowed a, a fellow member of Congress and other members were, were threatening to start fights, um, Mike Johnson's response was, well, we've been working for 10 weeks. It's a pressure cooker here. These things are going to happen. And I, I've been to work for 10 weeks in a row and never once threatened to beat up a Teamster. So <laughs> maybe Congress needs to, to like pull it together. And as uh, we go into the Thanksgiving uh, vacation week, uh, and we will be off next week because of Thanksgiving, but I wanted to ask uh, what you guys are thankful for this year and going forward. Nothing. <laughs> I, we were all waiting for the, someone else to say something. Well, I'm thankful that we've gotten back together and we're doing this again because this is super fun and it's it's a really good way of um, of clarifying my own thoughts and uh, and learning a lot every week. Um, I'm thankful as always for my husband and my children, and uh, I am uh, I'm thankful for everybody on social media who. <laughs> occasionally clicks like on something I've written because uh, that makes me feel pretty good. Thanks, guys. I am also thankful that we are back here doing this. Um, this does help me shape my thoughts, too. Uh, it helps give me, give me an outlet for my concerns and my fears and my frustrations. And trust me, my wife is very thankful. <laughs> we love um, you, Aura. <laughs> I am also very thankful for my wife, who has, who who has you know got, gone gone through with me and stayed with me through all of this. As much as social media gets uh, opprobrium, and in some cases it earns it, I am actually grateful to it for giving me the opportunity to reestablish friendships and relationships that I thought were gone twenty thirty years ago. What about you, Kevin? Well, uh, you know, obviously I'm thankful for Jessica. I'm thankful for our three kids, Max, Elliot, and Benicio. I'm thankful that my mom is still kicking at 102, and I talked to her today, and she's doing great. But when we sit around the Thanksgiving table, and I'm sure most families do this, and somebody asks that question, and it's, it's kind of a cliche to say, uh, I'm thankful to be healthy or for the health of my family. But as you guys know, and maybe not to the extent that uh, Greg knows or, or Joe, who couldn't be here this week. Oh, we forgot to mention that Greg is off making beautiful music this week. But this past couple of years, I've had some health challenges. I faced four different kinds of cancers, and I've come through on the other side. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm cured, that I'm cancer-free. But at this point in time, I am healthy. Uh, there is no visible cancers that need to be treated. And it has been a sobering experience to go through that. Never thought it was going to happen to me. Of course, everybody says that. And it has uh, given me a newfound understanding of what people who are much worse off than me, who have cancers that are debilitating and are life-threatening, what they're going through. And, and some of them are very close friends of ours here on the cast. Uh, I won't mention names, but some of our most avid listeners are also struggling with their own cancer diagnoses. So I'm fortunate and thankful that uh, at this point in time, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, and I want to hope that uh, we can make more progress on this and, and see more people see their suffering alleviated. Was that too serious a point to end the, the podcast on? No, nope, it's a great point. You know, I spent seven years advocating for better research and funding for cancer, um, cancer programs and uh, the the advances that I have seen since I started doing that and to today are extraordinary. And Kevin, you're a testament to that. Um, and I'm grateful that, that well, all it's of the, the doctors, people who, not me. Well, I just but, showed up but, for the appointments. You showed up for the appointments, but, but all of, all of the work that I have been 
able to observe has led to you being able to sit here and say, I had four types of cancer and here I am doing a podcast with hair. With hair. <laughs> with hair. <laughs> and my, my wife says that my new haircut may, makes me look like Dennis the Menace. I don't know. Um, but- um, I can see it. I can see it. You need some overalls, maybe a striped shirt. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I expect to see you wearing that on the movie next together, Kevin. I want you dressed as Dennis the Menace. I'll do my best. <laughs> With that, we want to thank our listeners for listening. If you like what we do, please share our link on your Facebook timeline so your friends will discover us as well. You can check us out at mpupodcast.com, uh, where you can read host bios and find uh, prior uh, episodes that maybe you didn't catch in the past. And uh, once again, we want to uh, say you're going to be listening to the music of Alan Keeney, who uh, composed our theme song. We lost Alan uh, this past fall, and we miss him. But we and have his that, wife, Sally, as part of our MPU family. Hi, Sally. <laughs> she is she is the, the leader of our fan club, and, and we always think about you, Sally. We talk about you behind your back when you're not listening. <laughs> And it's always, but always with love. good things. It's always with love. Oh my love. gosh, you're gonna make Sally paranoid. Uh, I think that's so and that's this. DJ's Happy job. Thanksgiving, Sally. <laughs> Happy so with that, what are you guys serving for Thanksgiving? DJ, you're not serving anything. You're going to a friend's house. Yeah, but we 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 um we are bringing the cornbread and a couple of pies. So we're serving something. But as for like the big. As for the turkey and stuff and all that, we're, no, we're going to someone else's house. Rebecca? Um, I, I'll be cooking. What I'll be cooking is sort of up in the air. There's definitely a turkey. I've got ingredients for other things. We'll see what happens. <laughs> There's definitely I'll, a turkey. You know, you walk into the store a couple days before Thanksgiving, and you know you can get a turkey, but it might be like 45 pounds worth of turkey. You know, a turkey enough to feed a small, small uh, community, and that's not what I needed. So the fact that I was able to find a turkey under 15 pounds was... <laughs> pretty happy thing i don't know you've got a teenager at your thanksgiving table i think that is true 30 35 pounds all by he could could eat that much turkey by himself but he'll do it at two in the morning (laughs) (laughs) like just raiding the refrigerator at night (laughs) 